Church, Pastor Roland here, and today we're going to unpack um, Acts chapter 2. This is just really some pastoral reflections, some thoughts that I've had, no doubt there are scholars, there's other people out there that are reading the scripture that have certain depths and understanding, so I encourage you to explore uh, those people. But really, this is designed to be able to reflect together in our homes, uh, be able to read the scripture and capture a bit of the heart of what the Lord was saying to us through the book of Acts. The, the birthing of the church, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, the power of God being revealed and his body going everywhere and taking the gospel into the world. Wonderful book. And we're going to, we're going to have a look at Acts chapter 2 today after doing Acts chapter 1 yesterday. So it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Very important scripture. You can be in a place, uh, but what the scripture is bringing out, they were all one accord, one heart, one mind, one focus. They were obeying the command to wait in Jerusalem until they received the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, just that positioning is, is the place for blessing. Get in the right place, seek the Lord there, uh, one heart amongst those that are gathering and look at what the Lord would pour out, his um, prophetic heart, his words, his strength, his revelation. So faithful people gathering, assembling, uh, calling out to the one that was going to bring the gift to them. And I think that's relevant wherever we're meeting at the moment, uh, even online, have the same heart to strengthen uh, one another. Let's remember it's the day of Pentecost. So Pentecost is a Greek word meaning 50th. Uh, so uh, it was the 50th day after Passover. It was also known as the Feast of Weeks in the, with the Hebrews. It was a, an annual pilgrimage that they would take uh, to Jerusalem uh, beyond this point. But the, the Feast of Weeks started with the beginning of the barley harvest. It was a spring harvest feast. And it, it was the commencement of the, the first fruit where the sheaf was uh, waved before the Lord. And uh, that was the beginning of the barley harvest. And then uh, after the barley harvest came the wheat harvest. And they took the Feast of the First Fruits together, which we now know as um, the Feast of Pentecost. So if you wanted to look at an Old Testament scripture, we can do that now. It's uh, Leviticus 23, verse 15 and 16. And you shall count for yourself from the days after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths, that's seven sevens, 49, shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. Uh, again, there's that, that statement of the 50th. Now, at this time of the first fruits, of the, the Feast of Weeks, it was a time when Israel would remember what happened at Sinai. And what happened at Sinai was the giving of the law. So the wind, the thunder, the fire, uh, some of that symbol and symbolism as the uh, law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai is similar to even what was happening in this upper room experience. You know, the, the powerful wind, the fire falling. Now, one was a remembrance of the old covenant and the giving of the law given by God perfect in, in heart and expressed nature, but given to mankind that were imperfect and, and, and unable to fill, fulfill the law. And really, the law, even though so beautiful, brought condemnation to mankind because we fell short of it. Now, Jesus is ushering in a new covenant and a new day. So just as the first fruits was a, was a beginning and a thanksgiving for the new grain, uh, so here is the Lord's doing something new. So we have the old covenant, but we have the birthing of the new covenant. Uh, also, if you read the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, Pentecost is also, um, is also recorded uh, there within the writings. And it, it, it's, it's linked to uh, Jubilee. And you remember the time of Jubilee was uh, a time when liberty could be proclaimed throughout Israel, that the trumpets would blast and, and debts would be forgiven. Uh, and also property could be restored uh, back to the Israel people. And so it was a, that was in the 50th year was the Jubilee time. Uh, and it's important to note the Jubilee because that pronouncement of liberty uh, to the nation and to the people uh, was very important at this time 
in that what has taken us captive, what have we been slaves to? Well, we've been slaves to sin, as we know, and the, the liberty that the Holy Spirit was going to now bring and pronounce to mankind was culminating right at this point of the Feast of Pentecost, being 50 days from Passover. So that's a little bit of the context. Please explore that for yourself. There's so much written on this subject. Uh, explore. Now let's have a look at Acts chapter 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting and there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is a gift of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit gave it to them and they began to speak as the gift was coming upon them and it, it came on all of them. So cloven tongues appeared on all of them or sat upon each of them. When we position before God and we have a heart of expectation, we all get filled. Uh, the Lord's not um, biased, as it were. If we've got a hungry heart, he'll fill it. And here the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the gift of tongues uh, is, is manifesting within this multitude of um, people that are gathering too. Remember at Jerusalem, they're hearing this and they're thinking, these guys are drunk. What's going on here? And we'll unpack that a little bit more now. Then appeared to them divided tongues of fire and sat on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Then verse 5, and we'll read down. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. So from all the known world, in various dispersions of the Jewish people, uh, they'd get dispersed out into nations and then through, through war and division and other things. And then would come back and pilgrimage back to Jerusalem for three major feasts annually and uh, other feasts as well. But uh, looking at this, let's have a look. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred and the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of in our own language in which we were born, Parthians and Medes? Elamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and to the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, uh, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongue the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Verse 13 says, Others mocking said they are full of new wine. Now, when you look at somebody that's drunk, uh, they, they stagger, there's some physical effects and, and also sometimes they'll, they'll babble or there'll be other things that come out of their mouth. So there's people around observing them just saying, look, they're just drunk. Just, they're just off their face. You know, they're not in a right state of mind. And they were mocking uh, what was a God encounter. Let's read a little bit more. Verse 14 and 15, but Peter standing up with the 11. Again, it's Peter that arises at this point. So Peter's really um, taking uh, as a point man, uh, an apostle, a pillar, to stand up in the midst of the 11, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and those who are in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. These are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the ninth the third hour of the day, that's around 9 a.m. in the morning. Verse 16 to 18, but this is what was spoken of the prophet Joel. So again, you see the apostles are going back into the minor prophets here. They're studying uh, the minor prophets like Joel. They're, they're studying the uh, major prophets. They're also going back into the, to the law, into the, um, into the Pentateuch, into the early writings and, and uncovering really what prophetically the Lord had been saying. And it's interesting, the depth of Scripture, Old and New Testament, and the treasures that are in these places. And so Peter was standing up and he quotes from this minor prophet who was writing around 700 years before Jesus appeared. 
So he's gone back several centuries and quoted from here. Let's look at Acts 2, 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my manservant and my maidservant, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. You know, there's a pouring out of my spirit and the key word there is all flesh. You know, you've got, you've got old men, you've got maidservants, you've got a young man, you've got daughters, you've got sons. You know, this is a description of all flesh. You know, your daughters are going to receive it. Your sons are going to receive it. The old men are going to receive it. There's manservants, there's maidservants, there's people that you might think they're just, they're just servants. They're a lesser class. They're not, necess- they're not royalty as such. There's a pouring out that's going to flood humanity. Now, as we know here, the, the peculiar treasure to the Lord were his people, uh, the, the Jews, the people of Israel. They, they had made a covenant with the Lord. And it was very interesting that the, even the early disciples sort of thought, well, this treasure, even this encounter, the gift of tongues, the ability uh, to, to the Holy Spirit being poured out, it, was, it must be just for uh, the Israel nation to restore the, the kingdom of Israel and to this peculiar treasure that he, he called and, and uh, covered and sheltered under his wing and, and manifest to the world. It was going to be such a, an adorning element for that nation. But it was much deeper than that, wasn't it? It was to be poured out on all flesh not just Jewish origins, but all flesh, every nation, tribe and tongue. And this was an amazing thing to uh, the people round about. They, they, they would have thought that they were set apart, but the Lord's really calling a, an overflow of his spirit to flow out to the nations. Let's uh, look a little bit more. Verse 19 to 21, And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs on earth beneath, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. Uh, You know, some of the symbolism, even at Mount Sinai. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, This is a prophetic warning as well. It's that, you know, salvation is in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's our response to this great prophet like unto Moses that, was given the Lord himself that that you know even under Moses if the people didn't uh, listen and obey the direction of that God gave to Moses then then the nation would suffer and people could be lost how much more to respond to the call of Jesus Christ not to mock him or mock Holy Spirit but to but, but to call out as many as call on the name of the Lord will be saved we have to, you know, no, no matter if you're listening in whatever condition you are, or whether you're going full on with the Lord, whether you've been backslidden, whether you've turned back, whether there's regret, the Lord's really calling us to call on his name, to be full, filled with the Spirit and to take his gospel into the world. Let's look a little bit more and going down to verse 22 and 23 and 24. Men of Israel, hear the words, Jesus of Nazareth, the men attested by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs. You know, it wasn't just the words of Jesus that gave him influence. Uh, I mean, often we would, um, you know, we might listen to somebody for a little while if they were saying that they and the Father are one. But, but unless he did some stuff that revealed that God was incarnate within uh, Jesus, I'm sure that we wouldn't have followed him, and certainly the disciples wouldn't have laid down their life in that direction. But when he starts to command um, winds to be still and uh, heals leprosy and opens blind eyes, walks on water, um, feeds a multitude with a few fish and a few loaves, then you've got to start to think that this this man has not just got a mouth, but he's got the manifestation. He's more than just words. He's, he has the power even over the elements of nature. And Jesus is the Son of God, and he was, a, he was attested to by many miracles and many signs. You can have confidence that the same Jesus that attested back 2,000 years ago is the same Jesus that is manifest now. And the Holy Spirit that worked in Christ is the same Spirit that works in us. 
and really at this time it's the rising of sons and daughters it's not even so much the numerical number it's it's our belief do we believe that we are we are God's chosen people that we are vessels of honor that we have Christ incarnate within us to take his word to the world if you believe that then you will do the works that Jesus did let's uh, look a little bit further In verse 23, him being delivered by determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put him to death. So here, even the men of Israel that are gathered, Peter's standing up and he's saying, well, you've, this, is, this is the Lord. This is what he did through the testimony of life. And you've actually, uh, he's been crucified and, and, and put to death. And you're a part of that action. And I think with this manifestation, the power of God being poured out, there's, there's, and the various signs that are happening, there's a deep conviction coming, particularly on these men of Israel at this time. Jesus being betrayed, um, judged and crucified was predetermined by God for the deliverance and the salvation of mankind. Verse 24, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Wow, what a powerful scripture. It wasn't possible that death could hold him. You know, this is eternal life that we know Christ. Eternity enters when we believe and receive, not at the just at the end of our life after we depart this world. Eternity is knowing, knowing Christ, that the power of the resurrection is the power that we taste now. And it's not possible that even death can overcome a Holy Spirit or can overcome uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. It was not possible that death could hold him. Death doesn't rule us, doesn't control us, doesn't determine us. We're determined by the Christ in us. It's impossible to, for death to rule over our life if we are in Christ. Let's have a look. Verses 25 to 29. I, I'm not going to read through that. In fact, you can read down to verse uh, probably 31 or so of that whole section. Read it for yourself, but study it. Because Peter's really brings out about King David and the, how he prophesied concerning the Lord that, uh, that, that there would be a king uh, upon the throne of David. And, and if you want to look at the throne of David, look up 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7, verse 16 really about the everlasting throne that that david the great king saul david solomon but this perpetual reign of the throne of david that that jesus was christ was coming to rule from that everlasting throne and so he really brings out david who was attested as a, a great king in in israel and and uh, someone that was incredibly venerated that Peter uses the, the words of David and he quotes from Psalm 16, verse 8 to 11. So please read Psalm 16, 8 to 11. And uh, Peter, again, is quoting uh, a book uh, some you know thousand years earlier than this. So again, the, the disciples are preparing themselves and in Scripture and reading so that they've got... They've got Holy Spirit can quicken that word back to them and they, they, they can then deliver it to the peoples. So let's go down then reading through that. Um, yeah, we also brought out that King David was both king and prophet and he spoke of Jesus. It's pretty wonderful, isn't it? Acts chapter 2, verse 32 to 37. Let's read that. This Jesus God raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heavens, but he says to himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both the Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut in their heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? You know, we all have... I often feel for the nation of Israel and I, I feel for our own understanding. Sometimes it's, it's all right for us to be wise in hindsight and, and judge other people. But 
but our, our, our culture and our understandings and the depths of scripture and our, our learnings, people just think they're doing the right thing, doing certain things. There were many heretics at the time of Jesus. There were many other people that presented that they were messiahs. And, and you know, there was mistake and there were error and there was uh, shocking things that happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Lord's not wanting anyone to perish, and particularly those of the, the covenant and the offspring of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and the, the nation of, of Israel. Uh, he's wanting none to perish, but that all men would come to repentance. And here is there is a cry coming up from these men of Israel, what do we need to be do to be saved? And this is a pretty, this is a pivotal scripture because we could say, you know, we could be thinking right now, what do we need to do to be saved? And I think probably one of the most important scriptures uh, is this. If you want to know about et eternal life or salvation, then Peter, in verse 38, said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. So repent. Repent means to think again, to turn from living a particular way to a new way. Uh, please consider, you know, consider your life where you, you have regret and think, I've blown it. I've acted independently of my Heavenly Father. I've gone the opposite direction, but I just want to know how to come back and come home. So here he says, repent and be baptised. Critical to be baptised in water. Bury the old man, resurrection of the new man. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin, it's finished. Sin has been done away with. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here, the vessel is surrendered to God and then it's filled by God. If there was a lesson within the book of Acts, it's that. That the believers were of one accord. They were totally surrendered, totally dependent. And what happened? God filled them. If we're full of ourselves, there's not much room for anybody else. And, you know, God won't take second position if, if we, in our own pride, uh, turn away from him or say we can live without him. Then in that deception, we may die. But when we come to our sentence, senses, there's at a point where we can uh, call out to the Lord. Lord, save me. Here I am, Lord. I turn my heart, my life to you. I turn from my old life and I turn to you. Jesus, I believe that you died and that you rose again. For me, such a simple message, but the gospel is the most powerful force in the universe, has the power to uh, transform dead works to a living person, a, a brand new life. Most powerful, important message is the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's read on a little bit more. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Verse 41, Then those who gladly received the word were baptised, and that day about 3,000 souls were added. That's some um, baptism service, isn't it? 3,000 souls. What an amazing outpouring of God's Spirit. Verse 42, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Such unity of the early church, they continued, they continued steadfastly. They didn't give up. They stayed focused. The apostles' doctrine, you know, the learning of the first-hand eye accounts of Jesus and being with him and then being able to bring his teachings out. And obviously the disciples had spent three and a half years or so with, with Jesus and had learnt much, seen much, knew much. Plus they had the 40 days uh, where the Lord had appeared after his resurrection. Uh, then they had this new awakening of the Holy Spirit. No doubt the Holy Spirit was quickening and bringing fresh revelation and the scriptures were coming alive to them probably like never before. So in this, the apostles were bringing such revelation the church was being strengthened and the body of Christ continued steadfastly in one accord. Um, then it says, uh, now all who believed were together, verse 44. Um, now all who believed were together and had all things in common. You know, the beautiful unity of the body of Christ. That's what we're seeing in Australia, aren't we? The body of Christ across uh, all denom denominations, um, you know, just those that love Jesus and love his word and love the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The body is really rising in our nation and uh, the strength of great ministers and, and the body of Christ as a whole 
is, is going from health to health. And uh, you know, there's many things that you can see in the world and during this time of the pandemic. But one thing the Lord is doing in this, he's purifying his church and he's causing us to give this 2020 vision. You know, we talk about 2020. Well, there were so many distractions, wasn't there, uh, in our life, whether it's I'm not saying we don't have fun, don't have family, don't have leisure, don't have good times. Of course, we need need refreshment and joy and all those things. But just self-absorption and, and uh, you know, the me-centeredness, I think the Lord's really working that out of our nation and that we can set a common focus to, to, to really set our 2020 vision on Jesus Christ and his word and I commend our leaders at the moment. They're doing a great job. And just to seeing leaders of different persuasions coming together and working for the good of the nation, uh, I just applaud that under our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. So, uh, you know, I really think that, that there is a, a new day. I feel for those that are that are suffering, those that have lost jobs. And, and as a body of Christ, we need to be able to love outside just our congregations, but to be light and uh, to the world, so those that are suffering sickness, those in fear, you know, Jesus' spiritual health is the is the critical need. We talk about critical services, uh, but there's no more critical service than the salvation of souls, and Jesus Christ needs to be front and center and at the foundation of fighting any uh, great adversity as a nation. But I respect our authorities, and I think they're doing all the frontline services have been working in a tremendous way so god bless you and i honor you just finishing now with verse 46 and 47 so continuing daily in oh it says in verse 45 i mightn't have read that sold their possessions um, and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need they weren't just uh, uh, you know possession focused they were focused on the good of humanity so continuing daily with one accord in the temple, notice that they continued in their spiritual devotion in the temple, breaking of bread from house to house, uh, beautiful symbolism there, the temple, uh, but also the house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity. There's a lot of joy and love happening in the body. Um, praising God, they didn't stop praising him, even though, I mean, the early church and the sufferings and the pressure were were sometimes horrific but the joy of the Lord no one could take away. Um, praising God and having favour with all the people. This is obviously they've got influence and there's good favour happening within the nation at this point. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being, being saved. Notice that they were being saved. People are on a journey of salvation and the Lord's working on their heart. The more exposure you can uh, have with your neighbour and your friend and your work colleague and being able to share the simplicity of the gospel and also this, the, the wonder of your own testimony, they're powerful forces. You know, God bless you. Have a wonderful week and we'll, we'll have a look at Acts chapter 3 very soon.